everyone and welcome. I'm Joe Brady and we're here today with Buddy and Bowen's lighting evangelist, Tony Corbell. Hey everybody. We're here to talk about some of Tony's new videos that are really exceptional, the really great learning tools, and we're going to take a lot of your questions live. So I've got my iPad here, you've got the chat room available to take advantage of that, so please do. And we'll be able to ask Tony questions as we're here. So Tony, why are we here? What are we going to look at today? Well, I think the concept here was to do a handful of videos of things that people most want to talk about. The first one that we're going to look at is, uh, I call it a one light, it's kind of a one light shoot. Basically, it's, it's, you know, not everybody can afford to go out and buy two, three, four, five lights at a time. You have to buy, start with one light. Sure. What can you do with one light? Well, we came up with a concept here of a one light fashion shoot that's, uh, it could be a portrait, it could be a child. You, could, you see this kind of type of light a lot. But basically, it's understanding the concept of how light works. Um, and it really doesn't matter what the, the subject matter is, as long as you understand how light works. It's a pretty simple, simple way to work. Uh, so the first video, I think it's going to make a lot of sense. It's, it doesn't matter to me if you've been doing this 20 years or, or 15 or 20 weeks. Yeah. Uh, I think you'll get something out of this, I hope. That's the <clears throat> concept well, anyway. Get that first light right. If you can get the get first the light first right, minute. then life gets real, really easy for you. So then, if, and by the way, these videos aren't long. They're three or four minutes. Yeah, they're not very long. So they're really going to be quick and to the point. Well, then we'll take your questions. The second video is going to be more of a dramatic lighting. And again, building with starting with one light and then adding on to it. It was the concept of once you start with one light, then what do you need to do next? It's like, well, we need an accent for here because we're losing part of the shoulder. Okay, fine. So then you bring in another light. Then you bring in another light. And then you might bring in one area of the background. And it's just a building process. So we're building pictures one light at a time, basically, is the concept. So there is a, there is a cutoff point. <clears throat> there is a cutoff point. You can, you, can, uh, you can keep lighting and lighting and lighting. A studio I worked with years and years ago in the 80s uh, with a man named Dean Collins. And uh, we, couldn't, we were doing these big commercial shoots. We did motorcycle shoots and a lot of car shoots. And we would just add light, and then we'd get another light, and then we'd add another light. And finally, we knew that we, it was taking us 12 and 15 hours to get a shoot done. And so finally, Dean came up with a new slogan in the studio. We light until it pays. <laughs> when the client says, oh, I love that, then everybody stop lighting it. Let's shoot it and go home. <laughs> You'd be amazed what you can get with just one light and it's, then just adding a couple to separate you out. Some, you can do some stuff with one light for sure. So then the third video is going to be a little bit of a different take. I think people are really going to enjoy this. Kind of a symmetrical lighting from behind. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a light that's very, very popular, and it's a, it's a style of photography that we see all over the place right now. It's published widely. You see it on magazine covers. Uh, you see it in uh, A lot of videos. sports stuff. A lot of sports. A lot of sports, a lot of sports guys are using it. Um, and, I, and there's a lot of this work being published, but not a lot of how it was done. So I wanted to go behind the scenes, and let's, let's step through this one light at a time and talk about the setup and how this, how this look kind of comes about. Also seems to be a popular way of lighting if you're going to be preparing for maybe a green screen shoot that you're going to separate it, them it, out and it really composite is. them It later. really is. It does give you a good, clean place to make an edit, for sure. So if you're interested in that kind of lighting where you want to bring out a, somebody into, put them in a stadium, say you've got a football player you shot on set, put them in the stadium, this is a really good way to do it. Yeah, it's a great way to do it. So we've got three videos to do. Yeah. While these are playing, get your questions ready. When we come back, we'll take some of your questions live. So let's start out with the first one. You can explain. You don't, I don't know if you want to explain right now or after the fact, but Tony has called it Da Vinci Lighting and Posing Techniques with One Light. We'll watch the video first, then come back, and I'll explain why. Okay, take a look. I did a little bit of research a few years ago on Da Vinci. And Da Vinci said that in order to produce the best depth in a painting, the shadow on the ground would be as long as your subject is tall. That's his way of telling us to consider 45 degree lighting. So my first stab at this was to put that light at 45 degrees up and 45 degrees from the camera because it's kind of like the ultimate wraparound sort of depth, shape, form, dimension on the face. Even though I brought the face back into the light, I still have a great shadow, a great fall off of light. And then we control the density of the shadow, certainly with what we do with the reflectors. But for position of that light, my beginning stroke is to put that at a 45. And it's just almost always a pretty good place to start. And sometimes you leave it there. If people have deep set eyes, you might drop it down a little bit lower. So basically it's a pretty simple shot. It's one light, a roll of paper, her positioned at a 45 to that light, and then two 4 by 8s that are taped together in the center that are just hinged as a V. One side black, one side white, and that's it. That was a pretty simple setup.
clearly working with the white and the black, there's an advantage and a disadvantage to both. With this gown, backed up enough to where I can see all of the gown, I know that the white is the choice because I can see the white reflected in the sequins. But I also wanted to come in close too on that face and then bring it in the black which just takes light away from that and gives me a, a negative fill and it just gives me a little bit more drama. So I can quickly go from one to the other without having to change my setup at all. It's just moving out the white and putting the black in place. You know, for this shot, this model is so great and I wanted her face to be open. And what I mean by open, I want her face to be more in the light than out of the light. So I was trying to direct her to work just slightly off access to the camera so she's not flat onto the camera and with her bringing her face back and up to the light a little bit. And when I do that also, I think I can direct her to her best attributes and show off her best features by just working with her a little bit, bringing her head back in, watching closely her legs, her arms, her feet. With someone like this, you can't hardly go wrong. It's hard to miss. You know, the beauty of a shot like this is for new photographers especially that don't have a lot of lights. They don't have a lot of money to invest in a lot of lights and they may be new in a small studio or they just might be just starting out. If you can find one light source, you're in business. This could be just an umbrella. It's not as big and it won't be as soft as the one I'm working with, but it's still a starting place and it's something that you could do easily. And keep in mind the 45 degree position. If you start at 45 and up 45, it's a great foundation and a place to begin. All right, just goes to show you can get great images with just one light. You can. You don't you, have to have it, a lot of it's them. It's all about placement and, uh, and, and sort of thinking it through. Just, just think forward a little bit. You know, and it works. That's something we need to explore more in the future, <laughs> the whole thought process for doing some of these things. Yeah. So you called this Da Vinci lighting. We've all heard about Rembrandt and Loop and Short and Broad. How'd you come up with Da Vinci? Well, it's what I was talking about in the, in the video. Um, you know, that, that whole notion of Da Vinci saying, you know, the shadow on the ground should be as tall as, your, as, as long as your subject is tall. Okay. So for me, that it is 45, and it is Da Vinci that sort of came up with it. Photographers all over the world know that their subjects seem to look best when their light is at a 45 degrees. Well, that's where it came from. It, 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 da Vinci is the one that said, you know what, at 45, it really does look good. There's good depth, shape, form, dimension, all of that stuff. Uh, Rembrandt gets credit for the Rembrandt style light on the face with the patterns of the face and the patterns of the shadows on the Cast offside the of the nose. Yeah. You know, with the tri little triangular light on the right. cheek and all that sort of thing. And that's great. But the 45 thing did come from Da Vinci. And Da Vinci, uh, you know, there's a little small booklet that uh, you can find online called a treatise, T-R-E-A-T-I-S-E, -E, Treatise on Painting. And there's one called Da Vinci. Uh, and it's a small little pamphlet that's, 10 bucks on Amazon, I think. And there's a chapter in there devoted to just shadow, light and shadow. And he talks a lot about that. And it's really, really worth, it's a worthwhile read. All right. So, so we've got some questions coming in uh, based on the, the shoot we just saw. And obviously you got great shots with one light. If you had to pick one or, or a couple, what are the best light shapers when you just have one light to use? I think, I think that's, a, that's, that's probably the best question. Okay. Uh, and I think the question is best answered by, it depends on how much of the subject I'm going to see. What Meaning, I mean by that is simply yeah. this. If I'm going to do a full length, you saw this was a very, very large octobank that I worked with. Yeah. It was a huge source because I've got to shoot full length. And I wanted the shadows not to be sharp edged uh, from the model. And I wanted the light to be able to reach past her to that, that gray wall. So in order to do that, I needed a big, big source. If I was coming in three-quarter, I could come in with a little bit smaller light shaper. If I was coming into a headshot, I could come in with a little bit of a smaller light source. So my answer is it depends on how much of my subject I'm going to see. Okay. Now, what's interesting is when you, when you do a 45-degree one-light shoot like this, as I back up to see more of my subject and I pull my light further and further away, as I pull my light further and further away, i got to raise it and raise it and raise it. To keep that 45 To keep degrees. that same angle. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense? So. How about position to the camera? Um, that's it. If, as long as it's at a 45 to my camera and 45 up. Okay, so it's 45 40, off 45 and, off and, and 45 up. up. Gotcha. However, <laughs> and here's where it gets tricky. 
there are some people's noses <laughs> that won't allow that. And eyes. And there are some eyes yeah. that won't allow that. So you do have to have... It's kind of like the rule of thirds. It's a good starting point. It's a great starting point, but then sometimes there, there might be a fence post in the way. Okay. So you got you know, you to make an adjustment. Yeah, when you have the nose that's a big yeah, bend or deep-set eyes, right. then yeah, that's right. either that or <laughs> reflectors or yeah. something. Okay, right. so you kind of mentioned this, but size of light source, how is that going to affect what posing you can do? Yeah. I know you like to be close. Well, I like I like I always I always go back to the rule that I learned and that I that I teach in my workshops, which is the size of any given light source is always relative to its distance to the subject. So, and that's I preach that in my week long workshop: size relative to distance. Uh, the thirty by forty softbox is a big softbox when it's really close. Yeah, if it's twenty five feet away, it's a small softbox. Yeah, it becomes a so point light source. It becomes a point, point light source at that point. So you really do have to keep in mind that the size, how it's. Its relative placement to the subject is everything. It's key to everything because it, it, it covers and handles the three major things, which is the edge of the shadow, the size of the highlight, and the brightness of the highlight. All three of those are controlled by the size of the light source. <clears throat> yep, of course. As you bring the light further away, the ratios are going to decrease. Everything changes. Uh, your shadows are going to get sharper. Right. So Your highlights become smaller, and as they become smaller, they become brighter. So... Just one light. One light. Just changing the yeah. distance. Backgrounds. Yeah. You used a plain paper background for this. What would be a good starting point? I, I, think, I think a medium gray is a great place to start because with a medium gray, I can make it go black by not putting light on it. Mm -hmm. And I can also put enough light on it to make it go white. So I think for me, it's always a good choice. Okay. And, and then I can color it. I can add gels. I can do a lot of things. But if I start with it pretty neutral, then I have a lot, I can I have room on both sides, so I do like that. And paper um, versus uh, a muslin versus painted versus it's a, it's a personal taste thing. Okay. I mean, I think you're going to run into what does the client, what does the job call for? Is it a traditional portrait? Yeah. Or is it something a little bit higher fashion? Something maybe a little more contemporary? Are you doing a high school senior with uh, trying to match a color to uh, to a school color perhaps? Uh, so it, it does it does kind of depend on the end result that you're looking for. Paper is nice because you don't have to worry about ironing out the wrinkles before you get started. I'll tell Just you one thing about paper, though, that off. people don't realize. Everybody that has a roll of white seamless hanging in their studio right now, take your soft box, take your take your soft box off of your light source, put your light right next to the paper. And turn off all the lights in the room and just skim the light across the surface, and you're going to see this thing bumpy and wavy, and it's a mess. When you front light it, you don't see all that. But if you edge light or try yeah. to send cross light across the background, <laughs> you'll see that rolls of smooth paper are pre-wrinkled for your use. <laughs> <laughs> so what other accessories do you want to bring in when you're dealing with this one? Well, light? in this particular shot, we talked about uh, our, we didn't want our shadow to go too dark, but more importantly than that, this woman was wearing this beautiful sequin dress. Yeah, it was nice. And, and sequins are a lot like chrome. Uh, when you photograph chrome products or jewelry or or uh, housewares, anything that's chrome and shiny, if it doesn't see light, it goes black, or it goes to the tonality of the environment within which it is resting. So with her dress, if I didn't bring in that big V-flat, which was two four by eight white foam core taped together, if I didn't bring that in, her dress was gonna go completely black on the whole uh, camera's left side, her right side. So I brought in that V-flat just to bring in, I, didn't, I wasn't looking for fill light for her shadows, I was looking for a specular highlight in those sequins. That's what it was all about for me. So just have, by the way, if you've never seen, if you're not familiar with what a V-flat is. V-flat is nothing more than two pieces of foam core taped together with a piece of gaffer's tape down the middle. That's it. And you can bend it in and out. So mine, I've got two white sides on this side, and then on the other side are two black sides. So you can make it go front. You can bend it either direction you want, depending on what you need in yeah. the, on the set. If you don't know where to find a V-flat, because try to have a V-flat shipped to your house. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> it's gonna be, even though the material is relatively cheap. If you don't have a supply place that's a big art store, maybe that sells 4 by 8 sheets, go to a home supply store. Yeah, go to Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever you've got in your neighborhood uh, and get those, uh, those large insulation A little sheets. foam insulation. Yeah, yeah you can get those and you can paint them. You can change your color if they don't have the right color for you. Yeah. But uh, they're very, very useful and they stand on their own. They don't require clamps or stands or anything, so it's pretty helpful. 
A uh, couple questions coming in. Somebody asked you, did you recommend medium gray or light gray? Yeah, for me, medium, because yeah. often I want my, I'll, I'll often want my background to appear black. And it's easier to make a medium gray go to black than it is a light gray uh, because of spillage and just ambient light in the room. Uh, once I can make that medium gray go black, then I can introduce color easier. So that's yeah. what I do. And I'm going to do a webinar on that coming up all about color and how to control gels and get vibrant screaming color. So. This, this is a little off topic, but it's something that comes up a lot. So mm -hmm. if you could address it real quickly. Sure. Uh, about shooting with a longer versus a short lens, advantage, disadvantage of each. You know, it's funny. A lot of people don't know this, but mostly lenses have one perspective. They all have the same perspective. The different focal lengths uh, will change and vary the photograph. But basically, the, the, the lens perspective is pretty much the same. So I can put that another way. OK. The distance from the nose to the ear, as long as the subject's head is in the same position where you are, isn't going to change regardless of your lens. Doesn't change. A wider lens is going to capture more. Yep. But since you have to come up closer with a wider lens, then the distance, the angle right. from your nose to your ear starts to increase. And that's what so, has spread out So consequently, out those what that tells me is if I, if, let's say with a, 50 millimeter lens, I'm doing a portrait and I'm up pretty close. I'm seeing that much of my background, right? I'm off camera, aren't I? About, <laughs> okay, this much of my background. If I back up and do that headshot with a 200 millimeter, well, I'm only seeing this much of my background area. What that tells me is it gives me the ability to bring things closer behind my subjects, and reflectors and accent lights and strip lights and hair lights. And I can do a lot more behind my client with a longer lens, and I think the face has a much better look when it's comp that compression look. Yeah, and again, I, I, what's really causing it is that angle and it's when more, you're it's, further away. It's more about where are your feet relative to your subject's position. So it's like, you know, if I shot with a 50 millimeter lens and back up to where I should be shooting with my 200 millimeter lens and take the same picture, of course, I'm seeing everything. Right. But then if I cropped in to just yes, the headshot, same shot. I get the exact same yeah. shot as I would with a 200. That's something that that people have trouble believing. We, fig we, have, yeah. we figure that out when you need a long lens and you don't have one, back up to where you would shoot if you had the long lens and then crop in. Yeah. And you'll see that you get the same perspective. So when you're, when you're setting up this light, let's go back to the light again. How do you judge distance when you're, when you're starting out? Is there some kind of recommendation you can offer as to how far should the light be from your subject as a starting point? For me, for me it's two things. I'm looking at the edge of the shadow, first and foremost. I'm looking at the edge of the shadow. Um, I study a lot of cinematographers, and I've got a, I've got a, thankfully, I've got a real nice DVD with interviews with the 30 most popular cinematographers that are alive and working today that have done some of the most amazing movies and films. And they all tend to agree that it's not about the light. It's often just about the shadow. Yeah. And so for me, Joe, that's, I mean, I, I really do yeah, like to look yeah. at my shadow. And, and if it needs a little sharper edge, then I can go to a little bit smaller source. Or I can take that big one and just back it up a little bit. But I'm watching that edge of that shadow first. That's my first decision. And yeah. then after that, then I'll look at the highlight and make sure the highlight's done. I know you're going to be exploring this more in the future. But really, the closer you get, the, gra the gradation from light to dark is going to be softer. It's going to yeah. be it, gentler. It's, it's a, great, it's a yeah. larger, wider gradation. You brought up something that Tony and I were talking before we started today about move old movies and cinematography. And most of us, at least before you got, before I know before I got into photography, I'd watch a movie just to watch the movie. Now I find myself almost watching the cinematography and where's the lighting and what's going on more than the movie sometimes. Yeah, I'm the same way. I'm not fun to watch a movie with. <laughs> <laughs> but these guys, but the really, the, the, the point is, these guys knew what they were doing with lighting. Completely. So it's a great place to look Absolutely. for portrait Absolutely. lighting. Check to see what these, these great cinematographers did. And I think there's something about the black and white movies that makes it easier to see the lighting patterns. It is. Yeah, Hitchcock, go, find any, go watch any Alfred Hitchcock movie. Hitchcock made the comment, I mean, the light quality is really good. And it's hard edge and it's very film noir looking and sometimes. But he... But he he made the comment in an interview before he died about uh, making a lot of mistakes with his lighting. But he says, if I've done my job properly in my yeah. genre of suspense, you're bought into the suspense of what's going on and you'll never notice the mistakes in the lighting. Um, but I love that kind of a look. But then I also like, there's a, there's a really silly movie out there that we, some of you have seen. 
some of you would never see, and I, I would never recommend it except for one thing. It's the movie's called Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I love that movie. It's the goofiest movie. <laughs> I mean, they're having kung fu fights on top of a tree. I mean, it's really, <laughs> I got the crew laughing. It's, they're having kung fu fights on the top of a tree, and it's a really silly, stupid movie. Except that the cinematographer for that film was a guy named Peter Powell, and Peter won the Academy Award for Best Cinematography that year from a movie that was a B or C class movie. But look at that film, and you can fast forward to any place in that movie and hit stop, and you'll see extraordinary lighting on every, yeah. on every frame. It's really exceptional lighting. That's something as we as photographers, we, we, again, we have a tendency to skip by many. Take some time, watch some of these old yeah. movies, watch what they're doing with the light, because these guys were masters of lighting. Yeah. True. Let's move on. Okay. All right, so Great. we've seen some, and there's more. You guys have more questions. We'll get to them. Let's just take a break and, and move on a little bit. So the next one, after you got the first light done, uh, you titled the second one, Building Dramatic Portrait Lighting One Light at a Time. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. We just finished a one light shoot. So now let's talk about, okay, so now we got, we'll do the next one with one light. Then we'll see what's missing and we'll add another piece to that. Then we'll see what's missing and add another piece to that. So we'll just slowly start building up the process. And we might also say that sometimes adding another light might just be bringing in a reflector. Could be. You don't necessarily have to buy another light all the time. In fact, I believe in this video, yeah. in order to open up some it's, shadows, you put a reflector yeah, in. Yeah, it's... it's uh, it's creating varying densities. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's watch the next video and we'll come back and take some more questions. One of my assistants one time said, when he had this big production with lots and lots of lights, I said, how did you light this? And he said, well, one light at a time. And I thought, what a brilliant statement. From then, I've, I've always sort of held true to that. You start with your main key light it's a building process, then it's building blocks onto that. So once you start and you've established the foundation, bam, there's your main light, that's your key light. Then you just start adding one more and one more and one more, and you're exposing for those and you're setting their exposure and their, their output based on that first one. And in this case especially, there's a lot of light and dark. And the idea with that was drama all the way. I just wanted drama. So basically, let's, let's walk around the set real quick. Let's talk about this shot from each element. So the first element is the main light. The main light is a grid spot up high, really accenting my subject's face. I did notice that it was spilling onto her chest a little bit, so we brought in a double net, which just knocked off about a half stop of light down the lower portion of it. We just slid it right in, covering about the lower third of that grid spot. Our second light then is the smaller medium softbox that's really sitting on the ground with an egg crate in front of it, skimming light right across the front of her gown. All it's doing is opening up that lower corner of the photograph. That's, I just didn't want it to fall to black down there. That's the only reason for that. And then in the background we've got our twin grids. And again, this is just because this is Hollywood. I'm just trying to make this look a little bit more of a glamorous shot. And so the controls there are how small or large the spots are, how close they are together, and their elevation, how high are they. So you can see that we put them in such a way that there's a big negative space right between the two, and that's where I placed my mind. And it came together exactly as I had sort of foreseen that it might. When you take on a role of a shot like this, you have to be in charge of this photograph. You can't just turn the model loose and let the model just pose herself because the sweet spot of that grid is so small that you've really got to direct her. And so my direction to the model was basically to keep her face in that hot spot where the exposure was dead on. And I really wanted those catch lights to be bright and shiny and really look crisp. So to do that, I know I had to work with her. And you can see I've got her shoulders a little bit away and then I have her head over and then up and then I would have to bring her eyes up. This required a little bit more maintenance on just getting her face in the right position. I think if you're interested in doing this kind of work or this kind of a picture, do yourself a favor and go back through and find pictures. Find old pictures from the Hollywood heyday, you know, and tear them out of a magazine and make a little folder with all your tear sheets and go through and pick out what you like and really closely look at it and try to determine how it was lit. Look at the highlights and look at the shadows and that'll tell you everything. The catch lights in the eye will always tell you how something was lit. So that's a really good place to start. Uh, but then just kind of walk around the set and start adding to that. And you can see that sometimes it was done with one light, sometimes it was done with six. Determine what's going to work best for you and for your style and the direction that you want to go.
Beautiful stuff, Tony. It's kind of fun, huh? Uh, so I love that look. Actually, she, let's, she had such a great face, though. You could get away that, with it. That, well, and well, we want we need to talk about that yeah. as well. Sure. Um, but what do you think defines just the word dramatic when we're talking about portrait lighting? Um, I think, deep, I think, deep shadows. Well, I think deep shadows. I mean, it's hard to have dramatic lighting with flat light. Obviously. So I think first and foremost is you got to have directional light. Light has to. You know, there's got to be some kind of dimension to your light quality. I think that uh, d dimensional light by nature means that your light is off camera, first off. Of course. And that it creates highlights and shadows. And you've got to have, you know, that was another thing that Da Vinci taught was you've got to have, uh, in order to produce depth in a painting, he said, you have to have three brightness levels. You've got to have the true brightness of your subject, uh, brightness that's brighter than the true brightness of your subject and a brightness that's darker than the true brightness. So you have to have, he basically told us, oh, psst, by the way, you got to have highlights and shadows yeah. um, in order to have depth in a painting. Well, it's the same thing for what we're doing today. So I think you have to have good, solid directional light first and foremost. Did you start the same thing? Start with your 45 again for that? Um, no, this one's a little bit more extreme. Okay. And if you notice, we had a much smaller source to get that harder edge shadow. So that okay. was, that seemed to be the, the, once I saw her come out of hair and makeup, and I saw her hair, it's like, oh, well, I got to have a hard shadow yeah. from that big curly cue coming across her. her so you, your main light right was eye. a uh, beauty dish. It was a smaller with, with light a, with, with a, a grid. grid with a grid spot. Yeah. Okay. So so that we could keep that light right where we wanted it. Okay. You know. Yeah. So it's pretty directional. So how many when you're doing when you're dealing with this dramatic lighting, uh, what kind of accessories are now changing from our from the one light portrait? to now this more dramatic lighting. Yeah, so in this case, now you're chiseling out the model's features. Okay. So the way I, the way I look at it is um, on the bottom lower right of that, you know, and, and we showed that in the video where her dress was just falling into darkness. Mm -hmm. So I wanted a little, just a wink of light down there, but I needed it to be not, I didn't want it to be attention grabbing. So I used a soft box down there really close. Okay. I just needed a little density, that's all, you know. And of course, to figure that out, you used a light meter. I, I will not work without my light meter. You, we'll do, well, we, we both agree on this, so we'll just say this once. You can't do studio lighting without a light meter. There are those of you that are watching this right now that are saying, ah, you guys are nuts. You don't need a meter. We have yeah. digital. You're right. We don't have to have a meter because we have digital. We have to have a meter so we can have a life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, you can get it we, right away. We, yeah. uh, it's funny. I did a shoot last Thursday. Um, I, did, I did a shoot with them. We did four, four changes, and I opened the files. I moved all the files over after she left, uh, and the hair and makeup gal had gone. And I looked at the files, and I was so thrilled because I, it's almost like practicing what I preach. Not one picture had to be color corrected or had any exposure adjustment. Yeah. I did retouching. Of course, I'm going to retouch my files, but, but I didn't have to do any correction, and I think there's a, that's the difference. No one's and that, paying and you that's to, why the meter. No one's paying you to stay in front Nobody's of your computer. paying me to edit. Uh, right. In fact, I'm actually, I'm going to be working on a program on that coming up shortly on using the color checker with a meter so that everything, what you get in camera fits. is as good as it everything can fits. be. Yeah. So let's go back to the model for a minute. Okay. We have this beautiful woman come in who's Madalena. had beautiful She's makeup so done. Can you do this kind of lighting with <clears throat> someone who isn't a professional model, just somebody <clears throat> normal coming into your studio? Nope. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can. You just, keep, just keep one thing in mind. The size of the source is relative to its distance to the subject. And the size of the source controls or, or contributes to the edge of the shadow. If I've got somebody with ruddy skin or if I've got somebody with wrinkles, I'm going to have a little bit of an issue with a smaller source. Whereas most photographs that we take, folks, let's be honest, are, are designed to be uh, complementary likeness of your subject. Well, if I've got somebody that's coming in, let's say I've got a couple coming in for a 60th wedding anniversary portrait. <laughs> I, before they even walk in the door, I've got a clue that I probably shouldn't use small lights. No. I might as well set up a big soft light because 60th anniversary means there's probably a wrinkle or two on these faces. Probably. Great. Well, then let's minimize the damage of the wrinkles by increasing the size of the source. So, I mean, you can do anything. Just keep in mind that it's all about the size of the source and the distance. Although I have seen a tendency lately, there seems to be a big, what's, I don't know, movement towards photographing older gentlemen and using that, that very directional that hard, light and having that, light. you know. Yeah, yeah. Kind it's of all about that grungy, yeah. crusty look. 
So yeah. if that's what you're after, yes. But I'm going to pretty much yeah. guarantee you that their wives aren't interested They're not going to buy it. They're not interested. A Maybe guy, of a them guy, they uh, would. A, a really great photographer in New Mexico uh, photographed me in a new headshot last summer with that look. And I posted it on my Facebook page, and it was up there three days before I pulled it down. Everybody hated it <laughs> and said it does not look like me. It's just too rough. It's too grungy and too, yeah, blah. So I just pulled it off. All right. So, <laughs> I liked it. But. Well, my new shot, my new headshot for uh, the Sony Artisan page is you shot for me. I did, so yeah. You shot that. pays to have a oh, well, professional <laughs> photographer around every once As a, a friend, while. yeah. Uh, so why did you choose on your background? You started bringing in those lights. Why did you choose to use those two lights on the background? Um, that was, a, that was a, a thought as we were setting up the shoot with my first main light shot uh, by itself. I thought, oh, it'd be nice if I had a little burst of light back in that corner. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to do that, why don't I just balance that with another burst of light in the other corner? So if you think about that, once, you know, it's almost like there was an old, an old portrait guy named Monty Zucker that said, you know, when you... When you start a session and you don't know what you're going to do quite exactly, and he said, go back to that, he said, I, he always called it the basic pose. Go back to the basic sh pose, if, especially if it's a woman, you know, there's our main light. You turn your shoulders away from the light, bring your head back to the light, fire off your first shot. You've got good de depth, shape, form, texture. You've got all the elements there. And from there, then the idea is start flowing. Yeah. But you always have to go back to that first base foundation picture before you can begin. So for me, after, as I'm shooting that, I'm like, oh, I think this will look great with a burst there, maybe another burst there. So I wasn't real sure I was going to do that until I started shooting. Then I knew exactly what I was going to do. So this seems to be the kind of lighting effect that you're probably not going to get away with with one light. You're going to need some others yeah, to separate out. Yeah, in this case, in this, this, is a, this is a job that calls for multiple lights. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Sometimes uh, let you got to do Let me check, see if we got any other questions coming in. Oh, do you ever use bare bulb strobes? I use bare bulb strobes a lot, but I never use them in the studio. Uh, for me, uh, bare bulb outdoors is great because it, it gives me the ability to light an area around my subject, maybe my subject and the ground in front of my subject, with a natural fall off or natural gradient to where there is no light. Uh, in the studio, I don't really necessarily need that so much, so I don't do that in the studio at all. But I do use that outside, but it's a great technique outdoors, really great technique. Uh, and I'll give you a little tip on how to use it properly. Find your primary directional of light. Uh, and if you're not sure, uh, my little trick is I always put my palm on my hand up, and I, and I just put this finger about an inch away, and I just move them around like this, and I'm looking for the shadow. When I find the shadow on my palm, then I know where the light's coming from. So then the trick is, if you're going to use a bare bulb, have it in the same location that your light's coming from anyway. Let it augment whatever ambient light is, and you'll have no Good conflicting idea. shadows. Yeah. So, a little tip. Good idea. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Uh, actually, hey, a little shout out to the Mission Prep High School just joined us. Oh, great. And uh, they're showing this webinar during their class. Oh, right on. Now, they asked if we could show the images that we're discussing. Unfortunately, we don't have them separated oh, out. Oh, we didn't separate but them. But they are on the BowensUSA.com website if you scroll Perfect. down. So, if you go on to BowensUSA.com and you scroll down underneath where Tony's programs are, you'll see stills from each of Perfect. the videos that we're talking about. Yeah, that's great. Well, thanks for you guys being here. I know it cuts into your uh, class time, but I appreciate that a lot. I want to also give a shout out to, to uh, a guy that I kind of sort of grew up with in Redosa, New Mexico. Uh, Herb Brunel is watching from New Mexico. Herb, thank you for tuning in. Herb was a, was a great, great inspiration to a lot of us growing up in that little mountain community. And of course, I have to say hi to Miss Mandy in Muskogee, who's editing this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, and to the rest of you did get mentioned, we're happy you're here. Yeah, too. we're, all, so we're glad you're all here. Thanks. So we've got one more video to take a look okay. at. Yep. Uh, this is the one we talked about earlier with the symmetrical lighting. Um, it's become popular as of late. Yeah, we see this, we see this picture a lot. It's, you see, as soon as you see it, you'll know what we're talking about. Um, what's interesting is that it really does uh, make almost anyone look better. So let's get back to our, our model shoot. So this is the symmetrical flash lighting mm -hmm. techniques. Again, take advantage of the chat room, send us some questions, and we'll be back as soon as this is done. Take a look. You know, this is one of the few photographs that I've ever done that everything is symmetrical. What I mean by that is, look at my model. She is dead into the camera. Her chin, her nose is right in there. Her eyes, right in there. My main light, 
is straight up above her nose and above my lens. So I've got the beauty dish up above with a grid spot. Then I've got coming down below that, I've got this wonderful silver reflector down below that just kind of fills in the blanks. It fills in under the nose, under the eyes, under the chin. But it also gave me a little bit of help in that jewelry. The jewelry that she was wearing looked great. And that silver it added little bits of accents and a little bit of highlights in that jewelry that I might have missed. Anytime that we photograph anything that's shiny, if it doesn't see something light, it's gonna go dark. And then in the background, symmetrically, I've got those twin strip lights. And those strip lights, which you can see in the video, they've got the grids, the, the egg crate grids. Now the egg crates have two purposes. One, they direct the light exactly where you want it and no place else. The second benefit is they don't flare my lens. If I turn those almost straight into my lens, I can still keep them from hitting my lens and causing me a flare. So for me, those egg crates are really, really important back there. And they, keep, they don't send light all over the set they keep it condensed down. It's not a focusable spot or any kind of a focus light, but it does make it positionable. So instead of coming out like this, it comes out like this, and then I can place it right where I want it. So those grids are really, really important to me. You know, about halfway through the shoot here, I realized that I wasn't getting the bounce off of that silver reflector that I wanted really into the face. So we took the grid off of the beauty dish and sort of angled it down just a little bit so I could get a little bit more spill down to the silver, and that just opened it up a little bit. Now, the last thing that we noticed here is that background was going a little bit dark on us. And I really wanted a little bit of light back there, so we put that last softbox on the floor. And I just opened it up and just put a little bit of light back there across the gray wall. Just needed to open it up just a little bit because I felt that it was a little bit dark. Primarily, this shot came together beautifully. Her face looks great. This is a very, very well-known technique in Hollywood. Uh, any imperfections sort of disappear. It's, a, it's really great for a headshot. You can move in as close as you want and see great texture and detail, and it's just really a nice look. For that, all right, that's very cool. That's yeah, cool that's lighting, fun. become it's, very popular. Well, it's fun, and like I say, you've seen it all over the place. Uh, and uh, at least so, you can see the thought process behind it a little bit. And you've probably seen a lot of like Gatorade and Nike ads, that kind of thing where you've got the athletes and they're lit li like that a lot, yeah. and put in some other backgrounds. They're not in those backgrounds, it's all green No, that's just stuff. straight out of the shot. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, this is, these are straight, but, the, but you, were, you were saying before we started that this is the type of light that makes it easy to edit later. Yes. Uh, that, uh, some people call it hatchet lighting, where you've got hard edge light coming from behind that kind of chisels out the edges of the Yeah, it makes that separation off the sides of the head yeah. much easier. Yeah, it does. So on the soft grids yeah. that you had coming from behind, yeah. are those grids an option or are they an absolute necessity? Um, they're, they're an option, but what they do is they sure make make life easy because it eliminates the possibility of getting flare in your lens. You've got two pretty, pretty bright lights coming directly forward towards your camera from behind your subject. Yeah. Anytime you do that, there's a danger of flare. And, and all the best lenses in the world, you, you, you can still pick up flare. Yeah. So the grids really, really do allow you to take that light that's coming spraying out at an angle like this, and it kind of narrows it down and it kind of keeps that light channeled a bit. So keep that lens shade on your Keep that lens, lens shade on, on regardless. Lens. I mean, that's a smart thing. For those of you at the mission prep, uh, don't <laughs> shoot without a lens shade. I don't know how many times I've dropped a camera and a lens shade has saved my lens. Yeah, they're, they're, so they're camera, the store, camera stores always try to sell you those little skylight filters. Yeah, no, forget that. Lens shade. Lens shade. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Does this kind of lighting, could you do this for actors' headshots? Would it work for that? Oh, I think so. Yeah. I think so. I think a lot, there. you know, there's a... There's a lot of people that are shooting a lot of great, great headshots right now. I'm seeing a lot of really good work. Um, and most of them use at least one accent light. And some are using two, but mostly one for sure. Okay. And, and what's interesting is, too, there's not a rule, really. If, I've, if I'm lighting you from, from the left of camera and I put an accent light from the right of camera, I'll see it a little bit easier because there's no, it's all shadow over here. Sure. So I'll see it pretty quickly. But a lot of people are using their accent on the same side as their main light. And that then does look like you do, it's, it, you know, the, the term is wraparound. I hate the term, but it does kind of feel a little bit like the light does kind of wrap all the way around forward. But the accent light being behind and then the main light coming from the same direction. 
So that's another yeah, look too. It's, it's a starting point. It, it's a great starting point. And, and again, you know, when you when you're eating soup for lunch, you salt for your own taste. Okay. See, so <laughs> it's all about your taste buds in lighting. I think. So however much salt you like in your soup, that's. You light it to suit your okay. taste, not my taste or his All taste. right, photographic and dietary recommendations from right. Tony Corbett. No, I'm a chef. Um, <laughs> just one other quick question about the V-flats. I'm just going to come on over here, Rick, if you just follow me. Somebody asked about, do you have a stand for these or do they stand up by themselves? They just stand up by themselves. It's just two big pieces of foam board. And again, as Tony mentioned, uh, go to your local home store and buy some of that big foam pan uh, insulation yeah. for houses and paint it. Yeah, and they're not very expensive. In fact, they sell them with silver, too, which they technically do. you could use as a silver reflector right. as well. But they're lightweight. Just don't try to have it shipped to your house. It would cost a fortune. <laughs> uh, let's see. Radio transmitters. What are yeah. you using to fire the lights? Well, obviously, I'm a Bowens guy. So there's, there's two options that, I, that, are, that are pretty easy to use with the Bowens, uh, and that is the, the built-in pulsar system that they, that they have that come with them or the optional... Um, Pocket Wizard, and I, and I use the Pocket Wizards because for, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, but I've, first and foremost, I've got a lot of Pocket Wizards laying around my studio. Yeah. Uh, but really, I've got the little, the, the little GEM, the GEM plug-in modules on all of my heads so that uh, I'm wireless and I don't have to plug in a Pocket Wizard separately on each head. I just have one transmitter on right. my camera and I just have to match that and marry that when I turn them on so they couple up when I power up the heads and then I'm hands free yeah. and I have no, um, I'm cable free basically in the studio. I don't want wires all over the place to fire my lights. One of the nice things about having the pocket wizards is, is maybe you don't have all of one type of light. You've got some old lights sitting around, you've got some old speed lights sitting around. Yeah. You can use pocket wizards to fire anything. Sure. So that's the beauty, sure. it works with everything. Uh, do you use gels? I use a lot of gels. Um, and in fact, we'll, there'll be a webinar coming up on gels. Uh, and we'll talk about them quite a bit. There's a lot of control that you can use with gels. The key with working with colored gels, and, and this is the key, and it's the toughest thing for people to understand. Before you can introduce color onto a background, you have to make sure that the background appears as black first. Then you can introduce color. If the background appears gray, light gray, dark gray, any kind of gray, then when you introduce color, it's gonna be a variation of that color probably a pastel of that color. Right. But you're not going to get that deep, rich, screaming, vibrant you're, blue. You're diluting it. You're diluting it yeah. with light. So uh, if you're in a small studio and you're working in your home and you're using umbrellas for your lighting, for example, you'll never, you'll never be able to do effective uh, color gels in that small space. It's just lights bouncing everywhere. Yeah, you need and it's contaminating light. the background. Yeah. You need directional light. You have and to have, that's it. That, that's the first thing. And that's, one, that's another good vote for the egg crates. It, it, it does keep light off your backgrounds. And remember to add salt to taste. Salt to taste. Okay. Yep. Uh, how many lights should you have in a kit to cover most jobs? What do you think? Well, <clears throat> I think there's an awful lot of, if you're a portrait photographer, I think there's a lot of work you can do with two lights. Uh, not always, but you can do a lot with two. Uh, I would never want to go without a backup light anywhere. So you want at least three. Um, I think it's reasonable to start off with a two-head kit as you start teaching yourself and you start learning. But as you progress, you're going to want another two-head kit pretty soon so that, you know, you end up with four lights. Yep. And with that, you can, you can light pretty much anything. But if you're just going to do only headshots in a small room, maybe you can get away with one or two lights, you know. And keep some reflectors. You definitely want to use some reflectors. That'll help for, for sure. when you only have two lights. For sure. Uh, Tony, good question here. Somebody asked about light meter settings. Yeah. So what are your different settings you're going for for the background, the hair, the shadow side? For the multiple setups yes. with multiple lights? Um, well, first and foremost, I'll always establish what is my main light, my key light, and that's the first reading I take. So let's say if I was shooting you at this light source that's lighting your face right uh -huh. here, I would take my meter reading right at your chin with the dome aimed right at that light, and I'd fire it off and take a look. Let's say it reads F11. What was that sound again? Okay, thank you. That's it. I've got sound effects. <laughs> now you open up the aperture, <laughs> I got lots of sound. When I fire off that strobe and I say, let's say it, let, it shoots, it says F11, and that's my exposure for Joe. Everything else in the studio then is relative to F11. So I might put on an accent light that's coming over here and just skimming into the edge of your hair and on your shoulder. And if I want that to have detail in it and not be blown out, then I'll set that at about, about a minus one from whatever I'm shooting at. 
So in that case, so one stop down. One stop down, I make that read F8. So I'm shooting at 11, take a meter reading with the dome aimed back at the accent light, and it reads F8. That's an important part. Just I gotta say light that again. It. I've got to aim that. You're measuring back to I'm the light measuring source. Measuring to yes. back to that light source. And if it reads 8, it's telling me, hey, Tony, if you shoot at 8, this is all going to look pretty good. Well, I'm shooting at 11. Well, then I'm going to be a little bit darker. And that's what gets me that extra little bit of detail in my highlights. I do not like my, my highlights to be blown out with that, with that detail. So, but I measure every light individually, and it's all relative to that first one I, right. I test, and that's my main light. So what the light meter allows you to do is get that kind of repeatability. You know if you want to have a 4 to 1 light ratio, that if my main is coming in at F11, I need to be two stops under Minus two over, there. over here, yeah. so I'm going to have to go down to 5.6. Yeah. That's what the light meter gives you. It gives you the information. Think of it's, it. Uh, well, you said repeatability. It is. It's yeah. repeatability, and it's also predictability. I can predict exactly what's going to happen because my meter just told me. Would you buy a house from a guy, a carpenter, who built your house without a tape measure? <laughs> I wouldn't have a door that could close anywhere in that house. <laughs> Basically, a light meter is your tape measure. It is. It's giving you the numbers to tell you what's going on with the light. Right. It's as simple as that. That's right. Uh, you, oh, somebody asked, you had mentioned uh, about a cinematographer documentary. Yeah. Did you mention? Yeah. You know okay, the name? so the name of, name of the, the DVD, title? the title of it is called Cinematographer's Style. So that's just the title of it, and it's put out by the uh, uh, Cinematographer Association. Okay. The uh, A, A. Yeah, too many letters. A C. But. Anyway. Anyway, <laughs> but it's but that that's the title of it. It's called Cinematographer's Style. Uh, they interview at least thirty cinematographers everywhere from from um, Gordon Willis, who did all the Godfather movies, uh, to uh, Vilma Zygmunt, who did Close Encounters of the Third Kind for Spielberg. Uh, uh, God, there's some brilliant, brilliant guys that are interviewed. Uh, Carpenter, who did Titanic, is in there. And, uh, anyway, yeah, as, as you're going to gain some great insight into how cinematographers think. As we said earlier, <clears throat> we as photographers have had, in the past, have had a tendency to ignore movies. Yeah. And I think what got me back into it was the ability to shoot video with my cameras. Well, and Hollywood's paying attention, too, because yeah. now more and more great, well-known photographers are shooting videos and films. Yeah. You know? You know, we do it for all our teaching stuff, so we want to get better when we're producing videos. We want, we want And we're quality. really learning right. to watch these, right. some of these classic videos, uh, yeah. classic movies. These guys knew lighting. So they do. you don't have to just look at they photographers. Do. That's true. And they knew shadows. And, one, and to your Da Vinci point, another place you always tell people to go. If you want to see great portraits, go to an art museum. You have to. You have These to. guys knew how to <clears> craft <throat> light. I didn't get that for years and years when I first started as a photographer. I thought that's where old guys go and when they have an afternoon to kill. But I started going, and I, and I noticed right away uh, with my, my short attention span, um, I would look at one painting and go, I don't get it. Then i go to the next painting and look at it and say, don't get that one. I go the next one, shake my head. I don't get that one. I go the next one, and I would just freeze. There's, there's, there is a painting waiting for you to look at yeah. somewhere in whatever gallery or museum you have locally in your, in your area. You have to go. You have to and get out. Go there. It's not the same as, as looking at oh, a no, painting you online. Don't look at it online. You yeah. have to go. You, you have to experience go. the size, the frame. Yeah. Walk around the it. The look. You, you need to sit down and look at it for a while. So somebody said, hey, guys, what about dark skin tones? My take on that is one simple sentence, and, and that would be you change your light quality to match your subject, but your light quantity, your, your exposure, you can't change. So I don't care if somebody's got, if it's Lily, 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 white skin from Ireland, Kelly O'Donnell, or if it's dark, 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 dark uh, African-American skin, the exposure is the same. Yeah. You can't change your exposure based on tonality. You have to change your exposure based on the output of the light. So you'll see accent lights, yeah. making sure the hair and shoulders are separated out from the background, that kind of thing. But as Tony said, exposure on the face is exposure on the face. Right. And that's the beauty of a light meter. Right. Because if F11 is hitting Tony's face, regardless of what color his skin is, F11 is the correct exposure for him. Right. And, and, and people will say, no, no, if they're really dark skin, you need to open up the aperture. Well, if you do, you just blew out the, the white dress shirt. Yeah. So you can't do it that way. It's, it's all about understanding light quality yes. versus light quantity. That was a lot in one uh, a lot. sitting. Yeah. We covered good stuff. one light, 
building up to, what do we end up with? Four lights yeah. and a, a couple of reflectors. Yeah. And then uh, the symmetrical lighting with the two from behind, the one in the front, and reflector below. Which was just a great shoot. I thought, I thought uh, Madalena did a great job. All the production team here, the edit, they did a great job of editing those videos together, I think. Uh, and they live on YouTube if you want to revisit those again. Yeah. You can also see them on Bowen, Bowens. Yeah. On Bowens TV. Go to YouTube channel, uh, Bowens TV, and you'll find, them, you'll find them there along with all the videos that I produce for the Q&A segments from our blog from, from TeamBowens.com. Anything closing words you want to Just add thanks for me? joining us. You know, we, we're, we're doing these pretty regularly now, as many of you know, that tune in regularly. Um, the Team Bowens blog is going very, very well. We're now introducing some guest bloggers uh, from the new team, uh, and you'll see a lot more guest bloggers. I'll continue to post answers and do video answers to your questions. Um, and just let us know what we can do to help you become a better photographer. That's what this is all about. So Great. Well, thank you guys again for watching, Tony. Thanks, Joe. I Always a pleasure. You. Thanks. Lots of fun. Uh, lots more to come up. We're just scratching the surface, so thanks for your great questions. Thanks for watching. Until Thanks, next everybody. time, see you again. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.